Hello guys and welcome to today's video. Now today I'm gonna try something a little bit different than what we normally do and that is instead of having the actual workflow like real time I'm gonna show you a little bit of a, of a I'm gonna show you a time lapse and I'm gonna be talking about the main tools that I use to get to this point. So as you guys know we've been working on this sort of like plague doctor's mask for the last couple of live streams it's turning out very very nicely and uh, one thing that you might see here is that I replace the original design for the beak with this more intricate design. And I want to show you a process that I used to achieve this. It's actually very simple, but it does involve a little bit of extra technical steps. So we're going to go over some very important things about retopology, UVs, and then using those UVs to project a texture right here. Let's go. So the first thing that I did with this little bit that you see right here is that I decimated the element so that we can bring it into Maya. And here instead of Maya, we went through the process of retopology. This is one thing that you're going to see and do a lot if you're doing hard surface stuff inside of Seabrush. If you really, really, really want to have like super tight edges, then retopologizing to have a proper like uh, subdivision workflow is usually the way to go. And I've seen multiple tutorials and more multiple pipelines do this where they create the base mesh of the like hard surface model inside of Seabrush and then they do retopology sometimes inside of ZBrush or sometimes inside of other softwares like in this case here inside of Maya and we make sure that everything flows nicely so as you can see here the most important thing is I'm dividing the beak into two parts the top part and the bottom part and this is very important because if you see closely on what we have on screen right now there's a line that goes from the top part to the bottom part and if you just sculpt it it looks sculpted if you really want to make it so that it, it's made out of two pieces then you really need to make it out of two pieces now, my rule of thumb when doing retopology, especially here using, um, what's the word, like quadrant and stuff, is to just make sure that everything flows in a sort of like a expected way. You don't really need to worry too much about topology for assets like this because the asset's not going to deform, right? It's always going to be a solid mesh. It's not going to deform. So as long as you have quads and triangles and everything is flowing in the direction that you want, in this case, we have a center line, we have a line or a loop going around the whole thing. And then just very important, a general like uniform distribution or uniform size of your quads and triangles. Why is this important? Because if we go back to ZBrush, we don't want to do Dynamesh again and just lose all of this uh, new topology that we have. We want to work with uh, subdivision levels. And if you have very big squares and very small squares, when you subdivide, the very small squares, or actually the very big squares, will have an issue like projecting the detail upon themselves. So it's very important that the, the amount or the density of your quads is very similar. You're going to see me do that in just a few seconds here inside of Maya, where I'm going to actually delete a couple of edge loops just to make sure that we have a, a journal uniform look for the whole thing there i think i'm going to be using a triangle as well triangles are not your enemies they're completely fine again especially if the object's not going to deform as long as it's not affecting your shading or anything and since i'm still going to be doing a high poly of this new piece right here and eventually if we need to we can retopologize again it really doesn't matter. So here, as you can see, I'm just like snapping all of this uh, vertices to the center, doing a mirror to the positive X axis, and we're going to extrude in. We're going to grab the whole thing and we're going to give it a, a nice extrusion to make sure that we get thickness. Because usually, me personally, I don't like to work inside of Seabrush with very thin objects. It becomes a little bit difficult. So I prefer to always have a little bit of thickness. You can see the thickness right there. By default, the normals were reversed, so we just flip them. And by going again into our cut tool, we can add some support edges to the parts that we want. There, I'm going to adjust a couple of things here on the very point of the beak. And I'm going to use soft selection to be able to just like quickly move all of the polygons around and get this very, very nice line going across the bottom part and the, the top part and the bottom part of the beak. Now that we have this, the next step, and this is what's going to be very important as soon as I say finish doing the support edges and stuff, is to go through the UV process. Now, I do have a UV video if UVs are one of the things that you struggle with. It's a relatively old video to this channel, so you might want to go into the library and just look for UVs, and it's called Five Steps for Perfect UVs or something like that. And it shows you my general technique. I usually use this technique for pretty much like 99% of the assets that I do, or characters even. So we're going to be using that one for this one in particular right here. A couple of extra support edges right there. I know there are a couple of pinches. I'm not too worried about those pinches right there because what's going to happen later on inside of Seabrush is we're going to be hammering them down and just adding a little bit of extra detail. So we go, of course, to the inside lines. And this is very important because what I want, what I mainly want out of this asset is the front part, the top part of the beak and the front part. You can see me cutting right there because we're going to use that UV island to plan out, to map out the detail that I show you at the beginning of the video. You can see me there doing the unfold. And since we only are worried about that top part, I just need to make sure that that one is as uniform or as like symmetrical as possible. And all of the other ones, I don't really need. 
Why is this important? This is again, it, this is a technique where you're mostly going to be using it if you have a very specific detail in mind, which in my case is, was this sort of like engraving that I wanted to do. And one of the things that you can do, again, this is going to take you more time. It took me about 35 minutes to do this whole process that you're seeing right now on screen. So I'm going to bring this into Photoshop and I'm going to be creating a black and white mask that's going to allow me to plan ahead on how I want my stuff to look. Some of you might be wondering, well, why are we not using alphas and things like that? The problem with alphas is that it's a lot of like trial and error, trial and error until you get exactly what you want. You can see there, again, I'm just like polishing and cleaning up the metal, giving it sort of like a used damaged metal effect to the whole thing. And this this is the new subdivided mesh that we have from Amaya. A little bit of move brush right there, and, and that's it. Later on, if we, or actually when I make this a game ready asset, I'm gonna do another retopology. And some people think that that's a little bit of a waste of time. I actually think it's a, it's better to do it that way because yes, it will it, it will require you to do two topologies like checks, but the thing is you're gonna get a way, way nicer control over your overall forms. So sometimes you gotta like sacrifice a little bit of time to get that quality that you're looking for. So here, what I'm going to be doing is, as you can see, we have the map inside of uh, Photoshop. This is the old school old school way of how we used to do this thing when the, when Substance Painter was not available. You can now do this in Substance Painter if you want, but I'm used to a little bit to the old school way. And as you can see, I'm grabbing this sort of like uh, engraving effects that will be very difficult to mask out by hand inside of Seabrush or even to hand place using the um, what's the word, the drag rect or the drag stroke. The problem with hand placing or using alphas is that it's very difficult to get a uniform effect on all of the elements. You might be going a little bit more strong on some of them. You might be going a little bit less strong on others. So if you do this thing that I'm about to show you here, you're going to get more consistent results, which I think works very nicely with the with the overall fear that we're going for. So I'm just repeating a couple of this ones right here. And of course, I'm only doing it on one side of the element because eventually we're going to mirror it to the other side, which is another cool thing, right? Because if we have this super clean UV, it's very easy to just grab one side of the element and map it to the other side. There, I'm trying to see if uh, we add a little bit more, but I felt like it was way too busy. So we just kept this one, duplicated to the other side, turn off the grid. This is a very important, very common mistake that people uh, like get when they are using this or a similar technique. And now that we have this, we can bring this into, um, into Seabrush. So back in Seabrush, this is very important. When you import the texture, you're going to see that the texture is not matching. This is because Seabrush always flips the B channel. So I had to go up there to the texture menu, load the texture again, flip it on B, and now load it as a texture. And in this point right here, what I'm doing is I'm going to be using a masking option. You can see it right there. That's called mask by color, mask by intensity. Now, you do need to have a, a high amount of division so that the mask is really clean, as you can see right here. And once you have that mask, that's it. All you need to do now is use a little bit of inflate. You can use the inflate balloon, although it is very small uh, or very uh, heavy on performance and you might get some crashes. And once you got that, that's pretty much it. After that point, I'm just adding some more details with my traditional clay buildup. I'm going to be adding a couple of extra holes here and there. And uh, that's pretty much it. Just continue working on the same sort of like detail that we've been doing on the on the rest of the mask. I'm going to go in just a couple of seconds here with my smooth brushes as well. And just as like smooth things a little bit. And then if we lose too much detail, we can go back and with Damien Standard, just like bring it back again. I, I want to be very clear about this technique because I know that there's going to be some comments saying like, oh, you could have done this with a height map and textures inside of Substance and you're going to save, you could have saved yourself like 30 minutes. Yes, if the only thing that you want to do is textures. But if this is something that I'm going to 3D print, for instance, for a cosplay or something, I need to have the sculpted detail because this sculpted detail is what eventually is going to be 3D printed. If I'm going to do some sort of like cinematic shot and I want to use some sort of like displacement later on to get like a lot of detail, I need to have the elements sculpted. So there's a lot of things that you might need to do that might not be the most efficient way sometimes but again depending on the time on the pipeline that you're working on sometimes they're going to ask you to do those extra steps just in case you're going to be using them later on i remember a couple of friends of mine that have worked at Blur Studios telling us that, uh, that that's what they do. Like sometimes even if they are going to use something for a semantic, they're going to be using like a ton, uh, a bunch more UDEMs that they might need or a bunch more resolution that they might need for the final shot, just in case the client eventually asks for another cinematic or another shot or some sort of like promo that they want to render at 8K to, to do a huge display on the building or something. So it, it's just a way to protect yourself because imagine if I just said, yeah, I'm just going to do this in texture. And then the client comes and they're like, oh, people love the mask. We want to have the mask as a cosplay sort of like trophy on our stand at E3. Well, E3 is now canceled, right? But 
if that's the case, then you're out of luck. So that's why this kind of techniques, again, I, I fully think that they're important for you, my friends. And that's it. This is the end of the video, my friends. I hope you liked it. I know this is a slightly different way to do it. I might do a little short on how to do like just the important steps of the masking process uh, in the next couple of days. But let me know. Did you like this style? Did you like this or like fast paced just narration of what I'm doing? It, uh, I'm not going to say it's easier to do. Sometimes it's easy to do the full narration, but this one was fun. And uh, I also thought that it was going to be a little bit weird to just hear me like work on a beak for 35 minutes so yeah if this is uh, the type of content that you guys like please let me know in the comments leave a like share subscribe we're trying to get to 7k by the end of this year you could make the difference and um, that's pretty much it my friends i'll see you back on the next one Bye bye